Hi again, Macedonia. It is uh, once again Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening, a little late today. Uh, I'm running a bit behind. Uh, it's been a crazy week, as you can imagine. And it's, you know, we find ourselves a week on further down the road, and uh, we're looking at uh, potentially an end to this. Uh, you know, we're, we're headed toward May 4th. Uh, things are supposed to open back up. Um, but I think what we know of as normal is, is probably gone. Um, you, I read um, today about uh, when this opens back up, um, how many people are going to still be afraid to go out in public or um, concerned about going into you know somewhere they were previously how how long will it be before um, you know before you can sit in a restaurant with somebody at the next table and not feel uncomfortable because someone is so close to you we've we've changed the way and kind of been conditioned now over the last 42 days. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, I think it's 45 days or maybe it's 185,273 days. I really don't know at this point. Um, I, I know the other day was 40, so uh, we'll go with 40 plus. Uh, but either way, um, as we move into a time that's, that's more open and, and, you know, things start to settle down, um, there's still going to be a long period of uncomfortable awkwardness uh, when we venture out. Uh, and I really believe that some things will not return to what we used to know as normal. Uh, there are still many people who have have no jobs. Uh, I heard, uh, I, I was listening in on a, a meeting earlier uh, discussing uh, reopening some businesses and had not considered the fact that restaurants have gone now so long without active supply. You know, they've either offloaded their food supplies or given it away, donated it, very good things, or sold it, whatever. Um, but they've not restocked. And now Monday, you know, businesses, some businesses can start reopening and they've got to resupply. And much of our food supply chain has been shifted either to consumer products or just shut down for a while. So there may be a period here where businesses, they can open, but they won't because uh, if you're a restaurant and you don't have food, there's nothing to sell. And I don't say that to alarm anybody or cause a panic or, or, or worry. Um, we got enough of that as it is. But uh, but the reality is, and the, and the point is that normal is is not going to be what we've always known it. Even church, we'll have church on Sunday as a drive-in service. And then the next Sunday, what will we do? Uh, we don't know yet. Um, we may still need to have a drive-in service uh, simply because we can't get everybody in the church in the way that matches the guidelines. Uh, we still have to figure that out. And, you know, so I, again, here, here we are, um, still studying Jonah. Um, we'll still study Jonah next week. And, and I think it still in many ways parallels our, our lives uh, because of the word that he brings to Nineveh. Because just like the city, much of our life has been overturned. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But we, Jonah chapter three uh, is where we pick up and, and where we left Jonah off was standing uh, in the middle of a puddle of fish vomit, we'll call it, uh, on a beach. Uh, we don't know what the weather conditions were, but uh, I really think that being covered in fish vomit on the sand, uh, there's there's nothing pleasant about that. And I would guess that Joan was probably just glad to be alive at that point, uh, but then God comes to him again. And remember what happened the first time God came to Jonah. He said, uh, Jonah just hightailed it. And and then, of course, ended up here after several days. Uh, so in chapter 3, 
It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, and, and I'm going to pause there because we it, the word of the Lord comes to him uh, the, the second time. Uh, it The word of the Lord came to him the first time. Now, I've not dug into this, but we know the word of the Lord, uh, and it's not capitalized in my in my translation, um, but the word of the Lord is also how we see Jesus referenced. So uh, it's not necessarily that a specific message to Nineveh was given to Jonah at this time, but God's presence came to Jonah. Uh, when it says, I believe when it says the word of the Lord, that's what it's referring to. And I say that uh, partly because in the next verses we see uh, a bit of a different communication from God. In verse 2 it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. And in this verse, we see something different. Before, the first time, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and I'll back up to chapter 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come before, before me. So Jonah wasn't given the first time around. He, God never got around to giving him the message to cry. It was, he just said, cry against it. And Jonah rose up and fled. Uh, so here we have a man of God disobeying God and fleeing, uh, but God gives him a second chance. So that he, now he's going to give him the proclamation to cry against Nineveh. He said, and so in verse 3, now this time it, it doesn't specifically say what the proclamation is yet, but immediately Jonah, so Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. It uh, doesn't say the route that he took. It doesn't we don't get any indication there, but we know that um, where in the general vicinity where he was most likely vomited up on the beach, he had to, had to make a fair trek to get to Nineveh. Uh, but it says, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. This doesn't mean that Nineveh was necessarily three days away. Um, it's in context of the greatness of the city. Uh, the city was three days across. So I don't know how long it takes, how long you, before you can walk in three days, if it was a leisurely walk, if it was a hard hike, if it was um, you know, strenuous or, or just a stroll. But the idea that whatever you can walk in three days, it was that big uh, is is makes it daunting. Um, it was a very large city. Uh, we also know from history that it was a very evil city. And and so every reason from our perspective for Jonah to be terrified here uh, of what he was going to face. And he so he, he is at the city and it says, then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. So Jonah went one day's walk through the city and cried out and said, and so here we finally see the message that Jonah is bringing to Nineveh. Uh, and the message itself is is interesting uh, because Jonah, again, the, the nature of Jonah, we see uh, he is not going to put his best effort into this. He, Jonah does not. He, in the measure of prophets, if you were going to have a minimum bar for a prophet, Jonah barely crawls over that bar. If you lay that bar on the ground, Jonah trips over it. Um, he does his best not to do anything he can to help Nineveh. He obeys God, uh, but he does it what from the scriptures appear to be the least possible. If you are a prophet and the word of the Lord comes to you and gives you a direct message um, there's no indication that this was or wasn't the very words that God told him, but uh, he only proceeded one day's walk and he cried out. And so I get this, this image of Jonah walking into the city, stopping and declaring his message. And his message went like this. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Uh, I, I kind of chuckle at this because here we are just over 45 days into our quarantine uh, and we feel like our world has been overthrown. Uh, it's 
it's kind of fitting in some respects that that we feel this way and and what we've been through and there are probably some people who are doing some repenting uh, and we all have probably been very uh, introspective and and done some deep thinking about where we're at what we're doing and how we're spending our time but Jonah's message here is for people who are who are known as the evil people. This is like if you hold somebody up as the bad guys in this time, this was Nineveh. Um, they weren't even nice to themselves. So he he proceeds to de declare the message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And in spite of what he does, which is the minimum, he doesn't tell them what they need to do. He doesn't tell them you know, how to repent, what they've done wrong. He doesn't tell them anything else. But in verse 5 and through the next several verses, we see something a bit ironic. And especially when you compare it to what Jonah's behavior has been. And you, you almost get the sense that he knew this was going to happen. And he certainly, and we'll talk about this next week in my favorite chapter of Jonah, which is chapter 4, uh, that Jonah was right in his concern, uh, but not his concern for Nineveh. It was his concern that he followed a forgiving God, uh, thankfully for us. But in verse 5, you, you see the response. So he's one day walk in, he makes his proclamation in verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and cloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. So they had no indication that what they were going to do, that their response, their reaction, there was no promise that they were going to have any kind of reaction or, or forgiveness from God. The, the proclamation was 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. They, by all rights and the prophecy which Jonah had given, they were doomed because it just says you're going to be overthrown. The reaction of the people, which we can, I think, relate to, we get into desperate situations and we start making promises, but there, it's the, the difference here is it says very clearly the people of Nineveh believed in God. There was a fundamental change in their character. They... Uh, and it says from the greatest to the least. But you have uh, an example here in the king himself. This is the wealthiest, probably the wealthiest, most powerful man in the city, maybe even in all of the world or region at this time. Uh, you could probably guess that he's most likely one of the most evil too, because you, in a, in a culture of the way theirs is described, you get to the top by being the meanest. Um, someone I know... Um, says the, the likes to say the meanest gets the most and that probably was very much the rule in Nineveh. Uh, so the king himself who had every reason to believe in his own power set aside his robes, his power, his authority. He covered himself in sackcloth and sat on ashes. He he degraded himself and humbled himself before God. And it says that all of the people believed in God. So he he makes a decree, he decrees that not only should they uh, follow God and, and and repent, but every beast, herd, and flock. And so the thing that they're doing is, is not only repenting, but they are completely submitting their entire society, uh, their way of life and their well-being before God for his forgiveness uh, and asking for it without any promise of forgiveness. It's just, it's fascinating to think that, that, they are so earnestly repentant. Again, when you contrast it against the way Jonah was, Jonah just wanted them to die. Uh, really, to sum up him, his feelings, that's what Jonah wanted. He did not want this because he wanted them to die. Does the minimum. 
he rebels and runs from God has to be uh, drug back, um, if you will. And, and yet the people of Nineveh, who are the evil ones here, they repent. And then in verse 10, the thing that Jonah feared the most. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is how we know that their repentance was true, because you can't fool God, you can't lie to God, and you, you can't deceive God. Um, so had their repentance not been totally sincere, there would not have been, uh, God would not have relented concerning the calamity which he had declared, as, as the Bible says. Jonah knew this was going to happen. Now, whether he's a good prophet or a bad prophet or, or just a lazy prophet, I don't know. But he he knew this was likely to happen because he was afraid they would repent. What's fascinating is in this chapter, Jonah's prophecy, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Overthrown can mean a couple of different things, at least, and depending on how you look at it, but we read it and say they're going to be conquered and destroyed. That's overthrown. We think of their social system and all of those things. But in reality, the prophecy was true uh, because God relenting relented from destroying them or bringing the calamity because they were overthrown. They overthrew their own sinful nature um, and and sinfulness and repented and threw off the shackles and, and repented to God and he forgave them. So they were overthrown uh, from their old ways to the new ways. And uh, and so in that respect, Jonah's prophecy was, was accurate. Now, like I said, Jonah was not happy about this. Uh, we can probably relate to some extent in, in your life. You may have had a time where someone has has done something, uh, sinned against you. They've done something to you or someone you love and, and hurt you or them in some way. And you have to think about forgiving uh, and you, you have to think about what happens. And we want justice. We are very much driven by justice. And thankfully, we don't receive justice uh, we don't receive the the penalty that we deserve. Um, we receive mercy. Um, God absolutely is just, and and we receive what we should. But we, in His mercy, are forgiven by the blood of Christ, and that changes the justice that we receive. Um, so He is always a just God, but. Jonah was not happy because he he knew this was what was going to happen or he expected it. And and in the same respect, do we ever have that attitude? That's I think where we we're at this point is where we kind of ponder to ourselves, are we a little happy when we see someone that's not really nice get their comeuppance? Um, do we get a little more joy than we should out of someone who is, um, let's say, just ornery, uh, evil, whatever you want to call them, who have made some seriously bad choices in their lives? Uh, do we feel a little vindicated when they get their just desserts? And I think we have to be humbled because we have to realize that if we were to receive that, uh, we would not be in a good place. Um, so we, we have to forgive with the forgiveness that we have received. And that's, that's the message of the Bible. Uh, but we will go on uh, next week. I'll pick it up in verse 4. And we're going to talk about Jonah's reaction to God's mercy, uh, the same mercy that he has received uh, and and benefited from God showed it to Nineveh and and Jonah's not happy about that. So again, verse chapter four, my favorite chapter in Jonah, uh, one I didn't even really realize was there for many many years. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll dive into that and and finish up Jonah next week.
So I hope you all have a wonderful evening, morning, whatever you happen to be watching this. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon.